Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be going through verses 9 through 22. And, and, and as I think about this message, as I was studying this message, uh, the first question that came to my mind is, who here is feeling the pressures of life? Everybody, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, do you feel it every day? Every day, right? I mean, even when I take a vacation, I still feel the pressures of life. And I feel the pressures of the world and society and people's opinions all the time. All the time. And I find it trying to shove me into its mold. Do you feel that way? I mean, think about it. Everything that we use at our disposal, whether it's social media, emails, phone calls, get-togethers, the world has an opinion, doesn't it? And I remember before I became a Christian, I remember saying to myself, you know what, I'm just going to be me. I'm not going to be what others want me to be, right? You ever said that before? I've definitely said that before. But the reality is, is if you're not living in the mold and plan that God has for you, then you're living for the world. You're living for your own desires and your own perspective too. And it seems like to me when I turn on the TV, when I look at my computer, when I look at my phone, when I survey the world around us, it seems like it's getting more and more farther away from God. Can we agree? It seems like it's getting more and more destructive and more chaotic, doesn't it seem? But we've already seen that that happened as we've been going through Genesis, haven't we? When people start doing it their own way, what we find is it starts to become destructive. Because you're only going after your own passions and your own desires. But that's not what God has for you, is it? Something happened here in Genesis chapter 6. And in verse 5, I'm not going to have it up yet. Joe read this last week. It says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So now we're getting into the very mind of the people before the flood happened, right? The thought life of the people. And that's exactly where sin begins, is in the thought life and in the heart of a person. It says, the wickedness of man was great. The word wickedness in the original language means it got really, really bad. It went from bad to worse. And in another translation, it says human wickedness was growing out of bounds. There was no stop. The trajectory continued to move so far away from God that God was non-existent in the life of people. And so, if you want to look at the New Testament and see what happened here, Paul gives us a great insight in Romans 1. He says, their foolish minds were darkened, and they were futile in their thoughts. They did not want to retain God in their thinking, so God gave them over to a, a debased mind to do whatever they wanted to do with themselves. That is a description of what was going on with people before the flood. But that's what's happening now in our own society, is it not? Is it not? Aren't we seeing more destruction happening all the time? You turn on your TV and I got to tell you, I get anxiety. I get, I get almost like I have to shut it off. Why? Because it's, it's becoming more and more apparently evil and destructive. Everybody has a problem. There's either suicide bombers or problems with other people or differing opinions. No one wants to share the love, do they? And so humanity moves farther and farther away from God. And I have to tell you because the reality is, is that in the Bible it tells us the trajectory of that will continue. 
to the end when Jesus comes back. Jesus said so. In Matthew 24, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. See, if we put our faith in whatever president or political movement or anything else, guess what? It's all going to just basically move to chaos. Because if the reality has nothing to do with what people can do, it has everything to do with God. And in verse 8, we see this big giant butt. That's right. A big butt. And what is that butt? It says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. No one would walk with God, but there was one man. There was one man that did. And one of my favorite scriptures comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 16. It says, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that it may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Noah was the man whose heart was completely God's. And not only that too, but, but he was living it out because God was real. And God found favor in Noah because he believed in God. Do you believe in God? Do you believe he has a plan for your life? Do you believe that he knows you or wants to know you personally? Noah walked with him and he lived a, rich, a righteous life, a life. And if you want to live a righteous life, what does that mean? That means I have a personal relationship with God. That I need to start living according to his ways and his plans and his desires. Not the world's. I want you to see how Noah responds in this, in this chunk of scripture. So let's read. Verse 9. It says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. First thing we see is Noah was a righteous man and he was blameless. But what does that mean when it looks at living righteously? What does that mean? The word blameless means that he, had, he was filled with moral integrity. In other words, what you see is what you get. What you see on the outside is what you see on the inside. He was through and through. It wasn't deceptive. It wasn't I do one thing I think one thing and I do another, right? He wasn't a hypocrite. Noah walked with God because he was loyal to the Lord. And there's a difference between reputation and character now, isn't it? With Noah, they were the same. His reputation and his character were the same. Because reputation is what people think of you on the outside. But your character is what you do behind closed doors. For Noah, those things were the same. He was the same through and through, blameless. And so he walked with God. And what saved Noah and his family from the flood is the same thing that saved Enoch from the judgment. Why he was taken from earth. We kind of saw that back in chapter 5 because he walked with God. And what does it mean really quick out loud? What does it mean to walk with God in your opinion? What does it mean? Anybody? What does it mean to walk with God? Yeah. Anybody else? What's your perspective of walking with God? Yeah. Yeah. Any more? What does it mean to walk with the Lord? Yeah. Are you walking with the Lord right now? Are you walking at the same speed? Are you allowing God to, to direct your lives? Are you living according to the ways of the Lord? Does your life emanate the essence of Jesus. See, I want, you to, I want you to understand everything around Noah was crazy. It was corrupt. It was chaotic. 
I mean, in some sense, he was almost alone, right? I mean, there were struggles all around him, but it, he didn't allow it to dictate his life nor his relationship with God. And so he walked with God in faithfulness despite all of the other outside influences and pressures that he felt. And so when we move into verse 11, it tells you what these pressures were, what the environment was. It says, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. I mean, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. And you know what's funny about this is because the reality is, is that we always think things are not as bad as they truly are, do we? We think, ah, oh, it's not that bad. Uh-uh. The reality is, is the things that sometimes we think are not that bad are devastating to God. I mean, I want you to hear this because when we start to think about this, right, the reality is there's an epidemic of violence in our culture and it's escalating consistently. How do I know? Let me share some statistics with you. According to a report by the FBI. There were an estimated 1.2 million violent crimes committed around the nation in 2015. During that year, there was an estimated 90,000 rapes and 20,000 people a year in our country, not worldwide, in our country were murdered. That's every 24 minutes a person is killed by another person. And these statistics are only based upon what was actually reported. And that's what we're dealing with right now. And it's escalating. And I want you to hear this. When I look at some of the time uh, on TV and the news reports and stuff, people are thinking that this is just becoming the norm. What, what's going on here? This is not the norm. This is not the way we should live our lives. We should value human life. We should think of people better than ourselves. And so the reality is, is that this is like in the days of Noah and it's continue moving that, that same trajectory. And it's evident, right? It's evident by what people watch, by what people let themselves be entertained by. It's evident in the statistics, isn't it? It starts out as something entertaining and it's just little. And before you know it, you're, you're submersed into it. Completely. You are following the crowd. My mom always told me, don't follow others. Why? Because all those other kids were bad and I was good. <laughs> right? No, I was probably the kid that was the bad kid telling everybody to do the bad stuff. And so then you get to the point where you say, how did I get here? And the reality is, is that we allow things to creep into our lives all the time. Do we not? What you Listen to what you watch, what we say. Everything is influencing our lives. Everything. And so the whole world was living in violence and corruption. And what was Noah going to do? What is Noah going to do? The Bible gives us insight to what we need to do because this is the same thing we need to follow. It says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you to hear the environment around Noah was crazy. How does a man live righteously? And how do we live righteously amongst a world that is hostile toward God? I mean, it's becoming more hostile, is it not? And so what do we do? What do we do? Something that was really great that we talked about on Wednesday in the men's time, we abide in Christ like Noah abided in God. To abide in Jesus means to keep his commandments. And to keep his commandments means to love God with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our souls. And we love our neighbors as ourselves. One way that we display our love for God is through our trust. Through our prayer and devotion to him. We abide through a relationship with God. We abide in a relationship with Jesus Christ and we pursue love. We pursue prayer 
and we obey in love, don't we? So Noah was abiding in God, even though there was all kinds of outside pressures. I mean, I want you to think about this. And there's sometimes I had a, a question in a Bible study um, not too long ago, and going, "Wait, what? So Noah and his family were the only believers on the whole entire world that believed in God? Yes, absolutely." See, we don't ever think that it ever gets that bad, but it's moving that way, is it not? And so and the reality is, is that people are trying to influence us all the time, all the time. Our enemies are trying to influence us. The world is trying to influence us, and our own flesh is trying to influence us with our passions and our desires. But the Bible tells us we're going to feel these pressures, are we not? Are we not going to feel these pressures? Because i got to tell you something. The biggest thing people say is, I got saved and now all my problems should go away. No, 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 no. Please, let's not be, (laughs) let's be real, okay? The day I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I got a big giant bullseye on my back. And it feels like all the fiery darts keep coming. But now I have something to vanquish those fiery darts, don't I? I have the Lord Jesus to help me. In 2 Corinthians, it tells us we are pressed on every side by troubles. But we are not crushed, we are not perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but not abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. We are victors. And I thought about this, and the reality is is that we do. We do feel all these pressures. And I started thinking about a kind of an analogy, right? And the analogy was that we ultimately, on a day-to-day basis, before we knew Christ, we were just like this empty can, right? Filled with poisonous Diet Coke, okay? I'm just kidding. I really like Diet Coke, actually. Dang it. And that's the thing. We're empty. We're empty. And the reality is, is that when we are empty, anything in this world can put pressure on us and just crush us completely on a regular basis, right? But what happens, right? What happens? We, we finally start to, we get into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he does? He starts He starts filling our lives. Oh, and it's coming all over the place too. He starts filling us up, right? And you know what happens is that the emptiness that we had before is now getting filled by God. We read his word. We pray. We have fellowship. We go to church. We start hanging out with people. We start growing in the Lord. And you know what happens to us? We don't get to be crushed anymore. You know that, right? uh? And you know what happens now? Guess what? We can now stand. We can be pressurized. We can do this. I need to learn how to do balance. But but you know what the reality is? Is I can step on this can. It's under pressure, but it doesn't get crushed. And the reality is, is that's exactly what God wants us to know. Is that we can have all the pressures around us, but God is our sustainer. And Jesus is going to lift us up. And he's going to help us endure. But you have to trust that he's going to do the work. You have to trust. And so I want to start our group discussions with these three questions, and I'll put them up in a second. And the questions are this, what pressures do you feel on a daily basis? Because i got to be honest with you. You know, we walk into church every once in a while, and people go, hey, how's your week? And you know what people say? Great. Oh, man, I'm so good. And then you go home and you cry your eyes. Okay? So what pressures do you feel on a daily basis. And I want to know, share these amongst your group. How do you relieve yourself from these pressures? And the third question is this. How can you allow God to be more involved in bearing your pressures? Is that something you do? And the reality is, is that we have to have this this awareness. We have to have an awareness. We can't just live our lives on autopilot thinking, All right, God, just be the Superman of my life and just, you know, save the day constantly. We have to be aware and ask the Lord. It's a relationship, not just, you know, a come fly by night type thing. God wants us to be involved with him on a daily basis. And so how did Noah, and how do we, how do we keep living a righteous life? Now, it's not by isolating or insulating ourselves, because that's sometimes we do that, do we not? We like to isolate. We like to insulate ourselves. But I think there's something here in the word of God that I believe speaks to what's going on with the relationship. 
speaks to what we need to do. Found it in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because why? He cares for you. He cares for you. What does that mean? It means we just drop them into the hands of God. We just drop them. You know, I mean, when Noah was struggling, what do you think he did? He talked to the Lord. And so we need to start talking to the Lord about our struggles, about the things that we, we don't understand, the things that we, we need help with or encouragement on a regular basis. God, I need strength to endure these certain things that are going on in my life. Ask God to show you how you can make the best of the situation that you're in right now so that you can bring him glory. You don't have to throw those things in your life, the burdens you feel. You don't have to throw those in your own strength. You know what you need to do? You just drop them. You drop them into the lap or in the hands of God. Why? Because God is a burden bearer. And he does that because it demonstrates his power and his love for you. No one needed to be sustained in a time where everything was in chaos. Same thing with us. We need to be sustained. And we need to ask God to bear those burdens for us. And, and Mark talked about a scripture. What was that? Bearing one another's burdens. We, as the church, get to do that also as the body of Christ. And so how do you practically make that anxiety transfer from your back to God's back? Because this is something that had to take place in Noah's life. The answer is, you trust that he cares for you. You trust that he cares for you. You believe in that promise. It's not a matter of just, well, theory, but a matter of practicality. And so once you understand not only that God cares for you, theoretically, but you feel it. You know that he cares for you through your mind and your heart and your soul. You can cast your anxieties upon the Lord with thankful prayer. Do you think that Noah was just like, I'm going to live my life and I'm just going to do my thing and hey, God, high five, here we go. It was a daily thing that he had to do because the whole world was against him. And the whole world is against you too. And so what does this mean? Philippians tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have to do it daily. Submit daily. Follow daily. And what does this mean to us? What does this mean to the person like Noah? What does this mean? That God is not going to stand by and let things develop without his influence. You hear that? God is not going to stand by. It means he will act and he will work because he cares for you. You hear that? He cares for you. And as you continue to develop trust in your relationship with God, he makes his vision and his plans for your life more apparent, even despite all the outside pressures and circumstances that you might see that are insurmountable. I want you to see what happens when God says, hey, Noah, you're walking with me. I got something for you to do, right? And we know what, what the vision God had for Noah, isn't it? Let's read about it. It says, then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms. You shall cover it inside and out with pitch, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. And you shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit for the top. And set the door of the ark in the side of it. And you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, even I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. And they shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, and two of every kind will come to you keep them alive 
As for you, take for yourself some of the food which is edible and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for the food for you and for them. So God just lays out this whole giant blueprint, this vision to this man. Why? Because when you're walking with God, it is so crystal clear what God wants you to do, even when it seems like you can't do it. And so it's obvious that Noah had no idea how to build this big giant boat. I mean, Noah didn't understand how uh, the displacement of solid objects in water, but God gave him a plan. There's so many things in our lives right now that we have no clue about, but God wants to give you a plan and show you a way. And this was a big task, was it not? Was it not? I mean, I want you to understand, he was making a barge, a huge boat. How big was that boat? You know, we got it here in cubits, but I want to lay it down to you, kind of what this looks like. The ark was 450 feet long. What does that equal? It's about one and a half times the length of a football field, okay? The width was 75 feet wide, or one and a half times the width of a football field. Do you understand? I'm using all football field, okay? And the height of the ark was one time the width of a football field. So if you're looking down on a football field, go, that's big. Okay? That's big. And I want you to understand, he says, look, I want you to do all this, but I want to tell you something. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a special promise to you, Noah. Don't we love God's promises? Has God ever broken a promise? then I guess we can trust him, can't we? He says, look, God makes a promise, a covenant, which means God is going to bind himself by his own words to keep his own promise. Why? Because God is always faithful. God never breaks his promises. His children can trust in him, just like I can trust on him every single day to figure out all of the needs I have in my life. Now, there's another thing I want to point out, and that is how all these dang animals got in this boat, okay, right? I mean, think about it. God didn't say, hey, Noah, you're going to be walking a lot here, okay? You're going to have to go, go gather uh, animals up. And actually, you know what? You're going to open up a petting zoo right next to this big giant boat that you're going to build also. No, 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 that didn't happen, did it? You know what happened? God says, when the time comes, these animals are going to come to you. What? So God paints this picture. He says, look, I want you to do something amazing, something that is bigger than you can ever possibly imagine. And oh, by the way, I'm going to supply the needs for you. When the time comes, don't worry, I show up all the time. And so if we're living a righteous life and God and following God's plan, you don't have to work for everything. If you feel like you have to work for everything, guess what? You're missing the biggest piece of having the creator of the universe on your side. Stop working. Start joining. Start being in step with God. That's what was so beautiful about the relationship that Noah had with God. He walked with God. He was on the same pace with God. God was saying, let me lead you. Let me show you how all of this can be done. And so if God is your provider, then you can lean on him for provision for the things you need, not the things you want, but the things you need to fulfill his calling in your life. And so you might be sitting here today saying, God, I need something. I need something. What do you do? What do you do as a Christian when there's something you need? You ask, right? The first thing you do is you ask. You ask. And if, you, and, and if it doesn't happen, what do you do? You seek. And then if it doesn't happen, you knock. And what do you end up doing? You continue to seek the Lord. Why? Because he's cultivating a relationship with you. He's your father. He loves you. And he wants to see you grow in this relationship with him. So what did Noah do? Did he say, God, you're crazy. I don't know how to build boats. Go for wood, really? No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. He didn't say, God, everybody's going to think I'm crazy. Guess what? They already do. 
okay? Everybody's against you anyways, Noah. You're nuts. You're going to build this giant boat? <laughs> what is it going to float on? Huh? No, he didn't say that. If you walk with God and live a righteous life, you are free. You're free. No one knew that. He just felt liberated. It doesn't matter what people think, what the pressures of the world. You're free in Christ. Live in that freedom. Live in that freedom. But you have to ask. You have to just say, God, I acknowledge who you are on a daily basis. Submit your life and move forward in his power and his might. You can't just say, oh, God, can you come join me every once in a while? No, that's not how a relationship works. And so you walk with God. You walk with God. Even if you don't have all the answers, you cast your cares and then you lose the despair. God will always take over. And that is what Noah responded to. In verse 22, it says, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. And so he did. See, God, God might ask you to do something crazy, like have a relationship with him. Or God's going to ask you to do something out of your comfort zone. But what do you have to lose? Friends that don't approve of it? A world that rejects God? Look, we're here to, to do what God's will is, not for the support of man. And the reality is, is that we have this church body around us that's going to hold us accountable. You guys are not doing it alone. We're doing it together. And that's what I love about the body of Christ. Is that we can get together in this fellowship and lean upon one another. And talk about our struggles. And, 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 and work inside the confines of the church so that we understand I'm not alone. And I love every single one of you, and I want to be a part of your lives more. And the only time that that can happen is if we say, I'm gotta, I got to get over myself. Be transparent. I need to hear the shepherd's voice. I need to follow him, and I'm going to take these other sheep with me. Okay? So Noah didn't pick and choose what he did for God, did he? He didn't pick and choose. It says that Noah did all that God had commanded to him to do all of it why because noah lived his life according to god's will not his noah lived his life according to god's plan not his and noah lived his life according to god's way not his why because he walked with god he walked with god he was living righteous how are you doing that today right now See, we need to do that today with a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? We can't do it in our own strength. We do it through his power and his power alone. Now, I want to take this arc perspective. I want to put on display a salvation perspective that we see here. And that is, the ark is a symbol of salvation, right? And I want to close with this. The ark was invented by God, not by man. And Noah didn't come up with the idea Guess what? It was God's idea, God's design, God's blueprint, and it was completely God's. Salvation is completely God's. So if anybody tells you, oh, that's your delusional, you know, trying to make up for the, you know, insecurities you have, baloney. Because then there must be a lot of crazy people. And this plan was the only way that they could save, get saved from judgment, Right? There wasn't three or four paths or multiple ways to God. There was one, and that was the ark. Now, if you believe that there's many ways to God or multiple arks, you can believe that, but the reality is there's only one way to God. There's only one way. Why? Because that's the way God made it, okay? <laughs> you can believe all you want, but the reality is there's only one way, and that way is what? Through the Lord Jesus. And the ark only had one door. And Jesus said, I am the door. I am the gate. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one gets to the Father except what? Through me. And we need to believe that on a regular basis. 
So when we walk with Jesus and we live by his plan and his plan alone, we get to feel that presence that Noah did too. And the reality is we won't have any worries. We won't have any cares. Why? Because God is carrying our burdens. Why? Because he cares for us. And when we do that, God's going to use us for great things to be used. And it doesn't have to be big, crazy things. It could just start by saying something nice to somebody after you leave service. It could say, you know what? I appreciate you. You might see somebody at the grocery store and you have no clue. But if you ask God, who is it that can really affect? Who is it that I can really encourage? You might walk into someone's life and say, you know what? I just want to tell you, I appreciate you. Or you can tell them, I want you to know God loves you. And I've heard story after story after story of people saying, I needed that. And I want you to know that God loves every single one of you. I truly believe that because that's the reason why I'm here. That's the reason why I get up here just like Joe and impart the gifts that we have. Why? Because I love Jesus and I love the body of Christ. And I want to join you on this journey of life and understand that we are going to do it together and we can feel all the pressures of the world. But if you are in Jesus, you are always victorious. So I want to pray on that. And I want you to think about what Jesus did upon the cross as we take communion. And as we think about how Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed for our sins. And as we come into this relationship, by communion we take in the body and blood of Christ as a symbol of it integrating into our lives. Because a lot of you right now, need more of Jesus, just like I need more of Jesus. And so, um, while we take communion, just ask the Lord, God, what is it that I can do to get closer to you? So let's oh pray. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all worlds thy hands have made I see the stars 